Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Every Arkansan Podcast. I'm Drew Davis, and this week I've got my friend Paul Atkins from Canvas Community Church. They are a church that's reaching out across all boundaries, creating relationships and changing lives. Hope you enjoy. So glad you could take the time to join us today just to kind of share your heart and what God's kind of laid on you. So you grew up in Benton, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I did. I grew up in Benton. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Methodist from way back. I have a, a, a grand preacher's grandkid. That's the word. <laughs> I was trying to think of preacher's kid, but a preacher's grandkid. Um, and I'm a bishop's nephew. So uh, we're a denomination that has bishops, and that's about as fancy. So you as can't we get, be a though. PK. Do you have an acronym for a bishop? A, 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 a bishop's nephew. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> BN. I don't know. That's a weird an acronym. That's one. That's why we don't throw that one around very okay, much. Okay. Okay. But uh, um, I do have lots of uh, Methodist ties, and we were always, you know, kind of involved. Um, and I guess one of the things that I have talked about uh, and seen from a different perspective as I've grown up is how my folks tried their best to uh, connect us to people uh, in mission. Um, one particular Christmas, I remember uh, we her, their mom and dad Sunday school class had decided that they would adopt a family. I think this was before the, the where you could get a thing off the Angel Christmas tree. tree, angel tree at Walmart, <laughs> you know, and uh, and adopt a family officially. They it wasn't facilitated like that, so I don't know where they found this family, or or how they connected with them. But we cooked a supper and we had gifts and the whole nine yards. And I could probably see the the f- husband and father just kind of feeling really crappy that he couldn't do this mm-hmm. for his family, and we did it. For for them, Um, but the thing that I took away from that and that I take away from that now is not that we were awful Christians trying to, you know, make people feel bad because they were poor, but that we were, mom and dad wanted us to try to connect in whatever way we could across these lines that are there in the world. Um, So, I mean, I didn't have that awareness of how um, how we were stomping kind of on this family as we were trying to uh, show our love for them uh, until much later. Mm-hmm. And that, I, I, you know, if Dad's watching, I don't want him to feel <laughs> like he has done an awful thing or that my mom, who passed away last May, was, was not doing the right thing. But I just feel like... Um, it was a gift and a, and a learning moment as well, you know, because we're all trying to love people. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we do it well, sometimes we muck it up. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, that was one of the early memories of, of where I'm coming from in life. One of the first experiences I got is I got to know kids in the downtown area, just up and down MLK. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the kids said, are you one of those feel-good churches? I'm like, what? You know, feel-good churches? I'm like, What's a feel-good church? They go, you know, give us your turkeys, give us your hams, give us our Christmas gifts. When you're walking away, feel good about yourself, give each other a pat on the back, and don't come back till next year. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so much of the time yeah. we kind of mix up that that whole concept. We want to help, but we don't know how. Right. And the only way we're going to know how is to get in the mix. Right. And I mean, I think that's that's kind of cool because one of the stories you kind of shared earlier was this you went to college and you actually dropped a class and that was kind of a light bulb went off. Right. So do you want to kind of tell that story? Sure. I was actually, I was in seminary okay. and uh, it was a church history class. So I had to take it sometime, <laughs> but I didn't have to take it this semester because I just felt like not with this professor. I just, just I'm just going <laughs> to let this go for this time. It'll come back around. And it was a, we were in between church history professors. So I was just going to catch it on the next person they assigned church history to. Um, but instead of going to class that semester, I decided I would go and volunteer at this place called the Manor House, which is in Memphis. 
and it's a, it's a place of hospitality, kind of a living room for the, the homeless and poor in Memphis. Uh, and the goal there is just simply to offer hospitality, to be a welcoming space, offer a bunch of coffee, maybe some free socks, a couple showers, you know, as many as capacity mm-hmm. could hold, um, to make people know that they're wanted, welcomed, and cared for, and that we could be with them not to do stuff for them, but to just literally be with them as much as possible. And one of the things that I noticed just as in the course of that semester is one day I was getting myself some coffee and uh, another, a guest walked up beside me and said, hey, Paul, would you pass the sugar? And so I passed her the sugar. <laughs> yeah, It was totally ordinary, <laughs> but it was that moment where we've sort of, we crossed a boundary here. Right. She's a homeless person. She's coming from a different perspective and a different part of God's creation and God's and the experience of, of mm-hmm. humanity and uh, from me, different from me. And, and we have just sat here together at this holy table of coffee <laughs> and, uh, and communed. Mm-hmm. So it was, uh, that was kind of a, a, an aha for me as to the way I wanted to live life from there on, and the way I wanted um, to do church from there on, if as much as possible. And of course, that's a very small thing. Um, my seminary professor had done decades and, and you know years of work, decades of work personally and years of work in Memphis to get Manor House to the point where people could have that experience. It is both simple and very difficult kind of to get to that spot. Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, it's a challenge um, now that I'm in a place that's, and I'm building something with some other people and I'm building on what others have done um, to kind of craft a, a place where people can be welcome. Uh, and, and I think it's really interesting that so many people are scared to jump in and do something because they're like, I don't really know what it takes. Mm-hmm. I don't have this degree or I don't have this experience or whatever. And so much of the time with with someone that's experiencing homelessness or someone that's just grown up without, they've got these things that they do. And we're like, oh, that's what needs to be fixed, the behaviors or whatever. But it's not. It's really just what the need there is not to fix something, but to just be there, be present, listen. And then all of a sudden, it's amazing how God will speak and say, "Holy cow, that's that's my friend. That's mm-hmm. that that's my person." Mm-hmm. And I, I love I love the book. Same kind of different as me. Mm-hmm. Just this concept of just got to know the guy, just got to be friends with the guy, and all of a sudden things started coming out. And it's like we're all weird. <laughs> We've all got these things that someone looking from the other side of the table is different and. Yeah. Just sitting there, and it, a cup of coffee, the the drug of choice for we as Christians, is it is one of those things that can break down so many barriers. Yeah, the things may be the same. I mean, somebody may need to address addiction and homelessness and finding a job or getting an education or, or, or a bunch of different things, um, and they may walk through those doors eventually, it, but. The outward actions are the same, you know, uh, dealing with addiction, uh, job search, health, housing, all those things are are necessary. But what happens to get there, um, the motivation for how you approach those things with somebody is different um, if you're saying, Hi, I'm I'm here to fix this stuff. Let's do this, 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 and this. Versus, hey, you're you're my friend, um, and you've just said you want to get into recovery. Well, okay, where can we do that? And and solving that problem together, right? At, out of relationship, uh, I think we forget. Um, you know, that, that's the gift of, of incarnation. You know, that God came to be with us, mm-hmm. not to fix stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess 
theoretically, theologically, God could do whatever God wanted to do. Okay? But that's not how God chose to right. do things. God chose to do things from within our skin. And so that's what gives us the gift to be incarnational with each other, is to sit there and in the, in the muck and uh, uh, experience life together. Um, and out of that relationship is where salvation comes. Mm -hmm. Out of that being present is where, um, where all, the, all the good stuff mm -hmm. happens. Yeah, I, th I think it's always interesting. So you look at John three sixteen, and it's for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And we so many times get on our soapbox, oh, I'm going to live forever with Jesus. But when you look at everlasting life or eternal life, I think it's John 10, 10, it says this is eternal life, that you may know me and I may know you. And it's like, oh my goodness, this whole world that we've kind of wrapped ourselves around is about a relationship mm -hmm. and not about fire insurance right. I mean and and that so much of the time I always share my wife if I'm going to speak or do something she'll, she'll always point out oh you can't wear that or hey, you got some hairs hanging out your nose or, or whatever it is my wife loves me and we're in relationship and so when she points out my flaws I know she's got my best interest right when we try to solve someone's flaws without relationship, mm -hmm. all we do is push them away. Right. And so, I mean, I think one of the other things that one of your stories that you shared was about one of the things you do with um, it, prisoners, people that are currently incarcerated, is write them letters. Yeah. So, I mean, kind of share some of that. What? I often forget that I'm in the deep end of the pool with people. Um, and heavily engaged in people's um, situations that are um, really heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I sometimes forget how difficult it is if you're on the shallow end of the pool and you haven't even dipped your toe in yet mm -hmm. to, to look at what I'm doing out there and think, oh my good, how could you do that? Why are you out there? You know, I, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I'm, the, the letter writing thing is a way for people to kind of dip a toe in and engage with people in some uh, meaningful way. And it doesn't seem like it's very meaningful because what we do is, uh, we, we used to try, when we had about eight people on our jail and prison list, then uh, we would have three or four letters a piece. Uh, and then everybody would sign their name and just say, Good to see you, praying for you, sending you our love, or whatever, and a name. And I, I, if people are skittish, they can make up a name. <laughs> doesn't even matter. Um, but I think most of our people actually use their first name, their real first name. Um, and so we would have, each of them would get a separate letter, so that at, at mail call we'd hear, Joe, Joe, Joe. And, you know, the more name times they call your name at mail call, the, the more love you are, have. I mean, that's, it's, it's just like that at summer camp, mm -hmm. you know, you're like, if you didn't want to be the kid that didn't get any letters ever, and, you know, the person that just kept getting letters all the time, you're just like, but um, <laughs> you still want to be that kid. Um, and so that's, it's the same in, in an incarcerated situation. Um, so, but now we have like 30. Uh, so we have just one a piece. We do it once a month. Um, but these, these little notes... That, that show up in prisons uh, for, for our friends, they're gold. I mean, it's just, it's a little bit of love that shows up um, in a very dark place. And one of our friends, um, he had, uh, uh, he'd actually been to campus maybe once, but it was just a little bit too big a crowd. Um, dinner and movies, kind of a a big raucous party, sort of, <laughs> without alcohol and uh, well, without alcohol that we bring. <laughs> some people do do sneak some in, right, right. Uh, but uh, we we try to limit that if we can find it and, and ask people to remove it and maybe themselves depends on the situation. <laughs> but um, it's a big party, so it's kind of if you're if you don't like crowds, that's kind of a you you might be a little uncomfortable. And, and people that are in 
uh, homeless feel uncomfortable there too sometimes if they're not big on crowds. So um, he was not big on crowds and uh, Keith had been there once but then he was in the county jail uh, and some of our other friends were in the same unit with him and he asked to visit with us and so I just I got to sit in one chair and then they would bring three or four people one at a time <laughs> to visit with me it was it was great because normally I have to I have to walk all around the jail and then this time I just they just came to me and he had a check that he had won in some settlement somewhere for two hundred thirty seven dollars and fifty seven cents <laughs> and since he was incarcerated he had no way to cash it he wanted me to help him anyway by the time I figured out how to do that which if you need to know how to do that for somebody I can help you with that now <laughs> I know the process for cashing a check for somebody who's incarcerated. Um, by the time he uh, uh, got that check cashed, he was in the Department of Corrections in the prison system. And so we, we got him that money, put on his books, and he was like, he wrote us, man, I, I couldn't believe this windfall. I was going to buy all these luxuries for myself, like soap, you know, a luxury of soap. Uh, but it's a big deal. You know, get some extra soap and not the little bitty whatever state-issued soap that barely covers your arm. Um, but then he started thinking about all those people that were out homeless like him. And so he, he asked me to put only half of it on his books and use the other half for people who are on the streets. <laughs> so, um, and as we continued along, he, would, he wrote that he was in a really dark place. You know, the, the job of the prosecutor is, um, is to make people you know, to accuse them. Mm -hmm. that, is, that, that is the original word, hasatan, in the Old Testament, Satan, is the accuser. <laughs> Not to say that the prosecutors are Satan or satanic, but their job is to accuse mm -hmm. and to uphold what is right. Yeah. Okay? So in the, in the process of doing that, people who are on the receiving end of that usually don't feel very good. Yeah. Maybe they shouldn't for some <laughs> things, but... Um, they shouldn't, uh, shouldn't let that uh, accusation drown out all sense that God still loves them. And that had happened to Keith. Um, and he, was, he was just couldn't sleep enough to feel rested. He just didn't want to get up, didn't want to move. But we kept writing him. You know, we kept writing. Um, and every once in a while, send him a little care package, um, some candy or something. And eventually, it, and it happened like right around Easter. Maybe it was coincidence, maybe it wasn't. But he felt like there was some light and that maybe people would someday want him back around and cared about him and that God could care about him. And it was just those little deposits of care and concern and love um, that are back, that are placed in people's lives by people that may not ever meet them. Um, but that just shows the power of, of trying to enter somebody's life at whatever way you can and creating those little spaces where people can do that. And, I mean, we kind of skipped ahead, but you're part of Canvas Community. Right. And, I mean, it is a church, mm -hmm. but it's unlike probably any other church in this community. Probably so. I, I, I would be hard-pressed to find another church that's more of a community of, I don't want to say, I don't, I, I don't even know what in the wor world it is, but you've got very wealthy people, you've got the middle class, and you've got the poorest of the poor in the mm -hmm. city who come together for things like movie night mm -hmm. and worship and, and church, but beyond church, just community. And it's like a family. And, it, and it's really beautiful just to see how it's kind of developed. I mean, because I've, I've seen it. Yeah. I've been around for about 10 years. Yeah. And so I guess it, it predates me. A little bit. Um, but just seeing all that went on through the years there, and it's just maintained. Yeah, and it's it's, it's been strange uh, <laughs> because it, it was uh, – it started as a um, – worship service at a United Methodist Church in Midtown and then the, the team just said 
We're going to move downtown. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and by the way, we're our own church now, and uh, we're called Canvas Community. Thanks. It's, it was That's not how we start churches normally. Um, but w- for some reason, <laughs> the powers that be in our denomination didn't go bad. That's wrong. You should not ever do that. Stop it. Um, because somehow God was using this craziness. Um, and it, it developed into a, a, a community that uh, welcomed all, all people. Mm-hmm. Um, it was founded with people who uh, felt like homosexuality was a sin and people who were homosexuals. And they worked together. Uh, and maybe it didn't change their minds about each other or the situation or the issues, but the, um, they changed their minds about how to love each other and work together. And that has been kind of the DNA that, that, that began to expand. Um, and we started dinner in a movie because our friends who were homeless didn't feel welcome in the river market at the big mm-hmm. movies that the city would show. The city has become much more welcoming in the last seven years or so, six or seven years, and especially in the last two. Yeah. But uh, it, initially they weren't welcome, so they said, well, we've got a screen, we use it for worship, we'll just show a movie and we'll have dinner and we'll call it dinner and a movie. <laughs> We're very clever. We you know, on Wednesdays in the middle of the day we pray and we call it midday prayer. <laughs> it's, it's clever. Um, so we uh, we have lots of different pockets and people ways people connect. So it's I wish it were more together and there's more togetherness because we're there together in the same space than maybe in other churches where um, there's more division between. This is where this group does their worship thing. And this is where this group does their mission thing. And we try to get people over here to come over here. And we try to get them to come over here. But we just have one spot. But there are still distinct, the dinner and a movie crew that serves the meal and receives the meal and mixes in with the folks, that's kind of a a subset. But then some of them are also part of the worshiping community, and that includes folks who are experiencing homelessness and folks who do serve the meal and folks who never come on Wednesdays because that's the, the deep end of the pool or they're <laughs> not big crowd people, but they, they, have, they can connect in one-on-one in small ways. So um, that, that we have different pockets of people, and I'm... It, that's always been my the challenge that I, I want to see people make those connections, do that that coffee pot type of right. experience that I had and that I have on a regular basis when I just talk to people that are really different from me and we try to care about each other, show each other respect. And I, mean, I think that's a great thing to kind of start to move and wrapping this up is you're not a full-time minister at the church. Right. You're bivocational. Um, you work out in the secular world and you, you do ministry. This is also not what your the- theology degree was, was outreach and all of that. You're more of the worship type guy. Um, I think it's really important for people to get the fact that you don't have to be full-time right on staff somewhere um all of the craziness that can go on with that to actually help people right i um i intended to go to seminary to become a a music minister you know just in a middle class white church with choir and handbells and other (laughs) fun stuff i like that and then i had this experience at manor house when i skipped church history to to hang out with people um, who are living homeless and then everything else just just the whole um, it just screwed up every plan that I had there Um, but I didn't know how that was gonna work you know I just we were actually going and we still my family still goes to Quapaw Quarter United Methodist Church which also has a similar mission of welcoming all people and, and serving people who are at the bottom of the, the social scale. Um, but So we would go there on Sunday mornings, and then um, 
the, the pastor and pastor's wife uh, at the time, um, they asked me to play guitar for a month on Sunday evenings, or Monday evenings is when they worshiped in. So I was like, okay. Well, then they said, why don't you just keep doing that? And then Jamie got sick, and I said, well, why don't you preach once, and why don't you teach a Sunday school class, and you know, get involved with dinner and a movie. And, and we were doing all this stuff, and I got back involved in the ordination process, and I, I really didn't know how this was all going to turn into anything because, you know, campus is not a large mm -hmm. church. I mean, it's, it's even smaller now than it was back in the day. Um, even, so we have maybe 30, on a good day, 50 people in worship, and that's the, the contributions come in from mm -hmm. there as far as passing the plate around to support it. So uh, I didn't feel like I could bankrupt my family or the church, you know, to, to do this. Mm -hmm. So uh, fortunately, I, I had my previous life was in insurance. And I, I think you can do this with, with any profession if you figure out a way to make it work. But um, I was able to uh, use the, the miracle of, of renewal commissions <laughs> in insurance sales to uh, somewhat lean on that without actively working at it all the time. Um, and then start just doing what I felt I was called to do. Just when we meet people and they needed we found out they were in jail because we hadn't seen them in a meet in two weeks. Okay, I got to figure out how to get to the jails and, and how to get to see this person. So then I kept doing that and that turned into the letter writing thing and so on. And just different other connections that I made, one putting one step in front of the other, um, seeing what I needed to see. And I didn't still didn't know how that was really going to happen. And then I met, um, met a client who had worked for Campus Crusade their whole career. And I thought, this is crazy. You, you mean a group of maybe 100 to 150 people pays for you to live? <laughs> and, and you invited them to give money to do this? I thought, that, that just blew me away because that's not how any United Methodist would ever dream mm -hmm. of, of doing anything on a large scale like a, a salary for a grown up in America that has a mortgage, you know, and insurance and kids. Exactly. So it's like that's what you do when you're in high school and you want to go to camp, you know, I'm doing a mission trip. Mm -hmm. We'll do that for that, but not for a grown-up to, to actually live, to be like a missionary like that. So that's why I named what I am as urban missionary so that we could explain that to people who had a Baptist background and they understood about missionaries coming through and doing their song and dance about, you know, this is why this is important for you to support this. Um, so I just started doing that and inviting people that um, I had a connection with and I thought would have a connection with the ministry to literally do this with us. That's, that's kind of my pitch is that, please do this with me. Share what you have with me and I'll keep you informed and you can pray for us and we'll pray for you. Uh, we have people in prison who are praying for people who are my on my support team when they have cancer and they're sick and, and it, it's it's going it's gone way beyond what I thought I was doing was just trying to figure out a way to make a living to do ministry. Right. So, I mean, it really has revolutionized the way I think about giving and ministry. Um, and, but also that developed this other source of support for not just me, but for Canvas as well. Because like I said, we have about at most 50 bodies in the building that potentially would give <laughs> on a Sunday. And many of them may be homeless or don't trust the church because the church did them wrong way back when and they're not giving anybody <laughs> any money. Um, but they'll show up and see what's going on here at this crazy <laughs> little church downtown. Um, so this team has sort of filled in a gap um, because I'm not taking as much out as they're putting in. And, and it's just been interesting to see how that works. And also with another specific thing that happened to me was uh, our legislature created the, the private option or what they're calling Arkansas Works, which meant that the insurance world and my ministry world kind of collided. <laughs> And so a lot of the folks that I can help get insurance can be my insurance clients and I get 
kind of commissions to, to work with them on that as part of their life. So all of that cobbled together, I, I wouldn't have said, hey, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to make a little bit of money here, and I'm going to make a little bit of money here, and I'm going to do this, and, and, and that's going to work. I just went one step in front of the other and did what I felt like God needed me to do mm -hmm. at the time and just trusted that when it came time to take the next step, I would know what to do. And that's kind of how I have to do it because I really, um, I don't begin with the end in mind. I'm sorry, Mr. Covey. <laughs> I hate that little rule. I really don't, I really don't appreciate that because I don't know that any of us know what God has in mind for the, exactly the end. And nor does, do I believe that God usually tells us what is the end. I mean, maybe. It's possible. You know, you got to have some vision, I guess. I mean, I have a vision of, of a community that, that connects across these social lines and forms real relationships that result in um, a glimpse of the kingdom of God that, that liberates all of us. But beyond that, <laughs> what to do from day to day, how to pay my bills, how to uh, solve problems that people have, I, I'm just going to go as far as that little headlight in the fog <laughs> will, will lead me. And then when I get to the end of that, I'll be able to see a little further. And I think that's a huge thing to remember. I think a lot of times there's, there, there's um, a pastor, I won't even say his name because he's kind of controversial, but... But he says, so much of the time, um, we're having faith for a brand new car, mm -hmm. but we don't have faith for a pair of socks. God's the God that provides the little things, and then when, when we're faithful with those little things, then he can trust us with a bigger thing. And I think that's so much of my story with this. It was me and my truck, and I'm going to knock on doors and ask, what can I do for you? And now, all of a sudden, it's sometimes crazy to think about 60 staff and all the things that are going on and thousands of meals a day and all this other stuff and it's just like where did this come from yeah it was just me and my truck <laughs> and, 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 and it grew and then i look at so many of these other great ministry it was always these little small things and, and that's that was jesus's ministry mm -hmm. he went out and found 12 guys not probably the sharpest guys in the drawer either and i mean he revolutionized this world with just the little baby steps, with the little things, with the relationships. I mean, you don't hear about the miracles he was performing on the fishermen, except for a couple times there. And <laughs> it's like, okay, is this enough to get you mm -hmm. to come follow me? And that was it. It, was, it wasn't like, oh, here's a billion dollars or mm -hmm. all the gold in the world or whatever. Here's not just, here's more fish or, or something. But it's this God that just, he wants people involved. Yeah, and and it's the little steps. It doesn't have to be major. It's that cool drink of water. Mm -hmm. um, so, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be here. But also, you've been part of my journey, mm -hmm. whether you know it or not. Canvas has challenged me in a lot of ways. Um, when I first, one of my first experiences with Aaron Redden was Aaron saying, hey, let's let's go down to Canvas. We gotta check on them. They're doing a warming center. All of a sudden, I'm like looking at this, I'm like, what in the world? They can't do a warming center in this building. No, the we can't. The toilet stopped <laughs> up already. We only we got started, two of yeah. them. <laughs> and and so I mean, we did warming center because you guys did it. Because you set that example and we were like, well, we've got a building that's better suited for it. Let's do this. Yeah. And so many things that you guys challenged us to do. And a lot of that was that heart for people in relationships without judgment mm -hmm. whether it's you've been in jail whether you've experienced homelessness or whatever it was it was just like jesus loves you therefore i'm gonna love you and we'll let everything fall where it lies mm -hmm. so thank you for that thank you for just your heart and your willingness to serve and thank you for that professor causing you to want to just yeah. skip his class <laughs> i hope you really enjoyed hearing paul atkins share his journey of figuring out what God created him to do. It's a very special moment when you figure that out. And when you figure out it's so simple.
It's a cup of coffee. It's sitting down with another person, getting to know them. It's all about relationships. So regardless of what you think God's called you to do, get out there, make some relationships, be faithful with the people he's putting you on.